analysis. This is a little bit less, um, I would say, less technical than some of the topics that we've talked about, uh, but still a really important aspect of IT in general and specifically systems administration. Um, so first uh, aspect of this that I want to address is this idea of what we call a tiered IT department. As a systems administrator, you're one of the pieces of that puzzle of an overall I, uh, information technology department. You're going to have different, now I want to say branches, different groups within this I, IT department, the bigger that the organization gets. This kind of goes back to what we talked about in week one about uh, how your role as a sysadmin changes based on the size of the organization. Um, so you'll typically see these tier, this tiering of um, your IT department start to take place in the mid to large size organizations. Rarely see it in a small organization. They don't have the funding or the need probably processing wise or uh, technical work wise to separate those duties into you know, discrete little groups. But as we start to grow the size of the organization, that becomes more important because you want people to have more, you want more specialists who can focus on certain um, areas of uh, the IT organization and how it runs. So that's where this tiered approach comes into play. Um, this idea has been around for 30 years. It's not, it's not anything new. And a lot of companies adopt this way of implementing the IT department just to help things, um, help tasks move along more efficiently and to control budget, right? Because you don't want, you know, necessarily somebody who's got 20 years of experience and they're, you know, super expert in something, you know, answering phone calls about set, uh, recent passwords. So this is a way of putting the right people um, on the right tasks. Here's a little layout of what that uh, tiering looks like overall. We go from tier zero, which is actually a newer tier, it used to be one, two, and three, uh, but now they've added tiers zero and uh, tier, tier four to the overall uh, support level. And the, and the goal of, even though these tiers operate in different lanes, they, they're handling different types of work, overall, they're still trying to accomplish the same goal. There's a mission that's been set out by the organization um, as a whole. IT has a role in that overall mission. Each one of these uh, teams at these different tiers are going to help push the mission of the organization forward, but from their perspective. Um, and they'll have specific goals that they're trying to meet. Some of those goals are related to service. Some of those goals are related to compliance, implementing procedures, um, but it, they'll, be, they'll be very distinct. Uh, and, and a lot of that's gonna be tied to what tier their um, department exists at. So tier zero, this is one of those newer tiers I just mentioned. This is automated and self-service. Um, so when you go to, let's say, log in at Towson's, uh, log into your account at Towson and you forget your password, historically, prior to tier zero existing, you'd have to call uh, you know, a help desk representative or service desk representative, and then you go through the process of working with them so that they could reset your password. But now with automation tools, we have the ability to do that without any human interaction, right? We can just log into a system, answer some secret questions, you know, do a multi-factor, whatever. <laughs> and voila, the technology walks you through the process of resetting that password without you even having to talk to a human being. So tier zero is where all of that exists, the automation, the self-service capabilities. And the reason that this tier has been implemented is because it drastically reduces the level of human guided support that's necessary. Um, you see here that you got to figure 10 to 30 percent of your support calls. If I was a you know managing an IT department and we had you know a hundred calls, 30 of those calls could be resolved just by allowing this automated system to field them and handle them and resolve them. Uh, 
from a systems administrator's perspective, uh, you'll be involved in tier zero, but not as, of course, not as the one fielding the calls, but you'll more than likely be one of the people responsible for implementing and, and doing the care and feeding of these systems. Um, so, you know, company comes to you and they say, okay, we want a, we want people to be able to manage their own using their own passwords. You know, if they forget their passwords, we don't have a solution in place for that. As a systems administrator, you'll be the one researching products to implement or looking at the different configurations for solutions that you already own and figuring out how to set that up and implement it into the organization. At tier one, we have our frontline support team, AKA the help desk. Um, or sometimes you'll see, they'll be called the customer uh, support desk or customer service desk. Names vary depending on what organization that you're dealing with, but the job still remains the same. If a person, uh, a caller, a customer, um, and just to kind of clarify, customer in this sense doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I work for the company and the customer is an outside person coming to purchase a service or product from us. Um, in, in IT, but your customer can also be someone who works within your organization. Customer is anyone that you're providing a service to. So if I'm, the, if I'm a, um, a frontline technology person or a, a, even a systems administrator and a manager from another department says they need us to, they need me to do X, Y, and Z to get a system up and running. That manager within my organization is now my customer. So I, I treat them with the same customer service that I would treat, you know, somebody from the outside, uh, you know, outside of the organization with. All right. So just to clarify that. So here, these tier one, employees, these help desk representatives, they're dealing with customers, um, either external customers or internal customers to provide them with a step of service above that tier zero. So I couldn't get the, to stay with the password example, I couldn't get my password reset uh, with the, with the, uh, the automated tool. Maybe I forgot my, my reset questions or I forgot the, the answers to my password reset questions. So now the, the automated system doesn't work for me. So I've been given a number that I can call or, or a chat log that I can connect to um, uh, or, or something like that. Some other way of contacting an actual human so that I can get some assistance. The, these folks, these tier one um, uh, employees are the ones who will actually fill those calls and then provide that, uh, that technical support um, to that individual. Uh, this is a, we consider this an IT, an entry level, an entry level role. A lot of the, a lot of the work that's being done here is very common. So um, they built scripts or playbooks, or sometimes they call them SOP, standard operating procedures, for how to resolve certain types of technical calls that they're going to be fielding at this level, at this tier because the, the, the types of technical calls that they're getting are going to be, again, very common. They're going to, they're going to be, oh, yeah, I tried your automated system and, to reset my password, and it didn't work. And you're going to get like 50 of those. <laughs> so, so they just write down, basically, in a script, if somebody asks this question, then this is a response that th these are the three responses that might help them resolve their issue. And you notice, to quantify this, about 40 to 60% of your calls uh, for support will be addressed in tier one. So that's on top of that, on top of the, you know, the 10 to 30% that we're getting from, from that tier zero. So the bulk, over half of your um, support is going to be addressed at these lower tiers of support, zero and one. As we uh, get to more technical issues, more uh, well issues that are less commonplace that might require someone with a higher level of skill to address them, we move up to tier two. That's our backline support team. So uh, these are usually 
senior technicians. Uh, they might even be um, senior en engineers in some cases. Uh, the teams are going to be much smaller than the help than the help desk, the tier one team, because again, they're not fielding as much as many calls as your tier one. Your tier one is handling the the bulk of that incoming work, but then things that can't be addressed, say over the phone or through a remote a remote session, which is the preferred method of interacting with the customer at tier one, if it can't be addressed that way then it gets escalated or moved up the ladder to tier two to that team. And here they're going to, since, since the tier two team is a little bit more technically adept, they're going to be able to start digging a little bit deeper to resolve the problems. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll look at some of the job roles that fall into the second tier in a couple slides. But again, just remember that the team gets smaller and that's, that's a trend as you move up the ladder, as you go up this tier, there's going to be less, less personnel, less employees at each one of those tiers, but their skill level increases. So our tier one has a pretty, is a, I won't say low, but there there's the skill level is not as high as when we move up to the next tier, tier two, We'll have less people, higher skill level, and then so on and so forth, all the way up the ladder to tier four. Um, your tier three team, even um, even though they're smaller, they'll address about thirty percent of the um, another thirty percent of the issues that the organization uh, gets from customers. A lot of times, they'll actually have to go and perform hands-on work. Um, uh, with the organization, maybe they have to, you know, go to the person's computer physically and do some stuff to it. Maybe it's a, if there's a hardware issue or something on a system, a uh, networking or wiring issue, something that can't be resolved with a remote with a remote connectivity, or walk you can't walk through the walk a person through on the phone to get reach that solution. Then that's where tier two steps in. If they can't handle it, though, they still have an escalation point. They escalate up to tier three. Now, tier three, this is where I would say the majority, not all of your systems administration teams exist here, but the majority of organizations, this is where they land their systems administrators in tier three, technical and application support teams. Um, here uh, at this level, we get really adept people. They're subject, what we call SMEs or SMEs, subject matter experts. They're experts in their particular area. So you'll have networking, a networking team, and they so full of people who specialize in net, computer networking at higher levels, database folks, systems administrators, web developers, all of these discrete teams, even uh, sometimes, depending on uh, how heavily your organization relies on certain applications, they may they might even have teams that are there just to support a specific application. Uh, when I used to work for a hospital, uh, they had an application that they they have in hospitals an application that they use called Epic. They uh, they use it to track um, uh, patient healthcare records. Uh, it's very specialized you have the only way you can get trained in it is you have to go to Wisconsin with a company who makes the software uh, uh, with it, where they exist. And you have to take the training directly from them is that specialized. So the folks who work, who, who got that training and work to support that team, uh, support that application, they had a team of their own and that's all they did was support that application. So you'll see that. In, in certain organizations, again, depending on how um, how much they rely on a specific app, they might have a team for that as well. But across the board, these folks are gonna be subject matter experts. Their lane is that particular technology or application that they work with. <clears throat> uh, these teams typically are gonna report to uh, senior level management 
or or management within the IT department. <clears throat> so a lot of them, their direct their direct line, they have a direct line of communication to the upper levels of management because their level of expertise. They'll be advising upper level management on certain things. They're, they're the go-to people. But even there, that even though that they're they're at the top level within the organization, because tier three is about as that's as high as you get before you become management in a in an IT organization or organization's IT department. Tier three is the top. But there's still a, another escalation point beyond tier three that goes outside of the organization. And that's um, with your hardware, hardware and software vendors. So every tool, unless it was developed in-house, unless your company, you know, wrote the software specifically for your use or built the hardware equipment specifically for your use, uh, which is, you know, maybe five, 10 percent of companies do that. Most organizations purchase their uh, purchase their technology or they purchase the technology, an existing technology, and they tweak it. They customize it to their needs. Those are the more likely pathways that you'll deal with when it comes to hardware and software uh, technology. So because of that, there's another entity involved, and that's the company who wrote the software, the company who made the hardware. They themselves have IT departments. They themselves have a tiered customer support um, uh, set up they have a tier zero <laughs> through uh through three now they won't have a four of course because it's their is their equipment but they'll have a tier zero through three that you can tap into as a as a systems administrator you can tap into their uh technical support structure to get help on certain things so let's say you you're even though you're the subject matter expert you don't know everything so you tap in, you run, you come across a, a technical issue that you can't resolve. Don't freak out because you have somebody that you can call. You, you can pick up the phone and you can call Microsoft and get in contact with their, their, you know, level zero technical support and try to fix it through their automated system. Now you forget, you forget your global admin login for Office 365. Well. You were a global admin. Nobody can reset your password unless they happen to be other global admins in your system. But worst case scenario, you can call Microsoft, give them some information to prove that the subscription for Office 365 you're trying to log into belongs to you. And then they can reset your password for you or they can allow their automated system to do it. Or if it's something more technical than that, then they have, you know, help help desk personnel and they have desk side support where they can actually you know send somebody out like cisco for example they can if you're under warranty with some of their equipment they can send one of their technicians out to you if you can't resolve the technical issue with their equipment and they even have engineers for really really complex issues dealing with their product they have product engineers who that's all they do their whole job is learning the ins and outs of that specific product. Um, <clears throat> they now have teams of, they have product teams where this is the Cisco Meraki product team. All they do is Cisco Meraki networking hardware all day long. This AWS team, all they do is AWS security implementations all day long. So even at that level, as a you know tier three within your organization, you have somebody that you can call on to get support. So I'm kind of mentioned some of the roles that exist at these tiers and passing, um, but this is kind of a more direct list. Tier zero, you're not really gonna have any personnel per se there um, because it relies on automation, you know, or systems being put in place. So a systems administrator interacts with tier zero because they're we're we're typically the ones putting those automated systems in place for people to use. Tier the tier one roles include help desk technicians, customer support technicians, and a host of other names for that because IT roles are weird. Um, two different companies. We already experienced that week one when we talked about the systems administrator. 
it means different things at different organizations. The same is true for most IT roles. They, they, they can mean different things at different organizations. But for the most part, help desk technician is a tier one role, customer support technician, tier one role. They're the ones filled in those calls as they come in and provide that frontline support. Tier two roles are things like uh, desk, desk, uh, desk side support technician or depot technician. That's somebody who all they do is work with hardware, like fixing, uh, you know, fixing computer hardware and refurbishing equipment, things like that. So that's your tier two. Your tier three is where we start to get into these uh, specialized high level teams like networking and database and security. And then tier four, we have roles like vendor engineers. So you work for a company who makes the products that other companies use for their technology. Notice that on this list, I didn't put systems administrator. And that was, that was done on purpose because you could actually have a systems administrator exist at all of these roles except for row zero. And I already told you how a systems administrator interacts with row zero. But um, I've, been in, I've been in large organizations where we had level one systems administrators who were on the help desk team. They were, they were like, but they were like the top level of the help desk team right, be right before going into, let's say, a tier three role. They were someone with semi-tier three skills embedded in the help desk team to handle slightly more difficult um, technical issues. So for example, let's say most of the help desk folks were working from scripts on that team, but this systems administrator on, on the tier one, they know how to get into a server and make changes. All right, they weren't, weren't an expert, but they were more knowledgeable than maybe their peers. Um, in a mid-sized organization, your sysadmins might also provide desk side support. All right, so I might go to, if I'm in a mid-sized organization, I might go to somebody's computer and try to resolve an issue. And, and then I realize through troubleshooting, oh, it's not just their computer, it's all these other computers as well in the same area um, as this machine. And they're all trying to connect to the same server resource. So then I go and I pop onto the server and I make changes there to fix all those computers at once. So because of the smaller size of the organization, mid size, maybe they're combining the duties of a systems administrator with a tech support person. Uh, again, tier three is typically, again, as this is especially in a large organization, tier three is where your most of your organizations land their systems administrators because we tend, tend to be a higher level uh, of expertise. And then on the vendor side, your vendor engineers are essentially um, systems, systems administrators or systems engineers. Uh, uh, difference, a systems administrator runs uh, an existing, um, in most cases, a systems administrator manages and operates and you know, does the care and feeding of existing systems, whereas a, in, a systems engineer actually builds those systems. They, they come into an organization where a solution doesn't exist and they put a solution in place, but then they might start running it too. So that's why that those terms, you might see those terms used interchangeably, systems administrator, systems engineer, systems analyst. Um, I've had all three of those job roles and pretty much did the same thing. So they're at the vendor level, you'll have that too. Um, they even, they even have, uh, what do they call them? Sales engineers. So they're basically systems administrators that are part of the sales team and they go and they set up demos for organizations who are thinking about buying a certain software solution or product. So they're still a systems administrator, but they're embedded in the sales team for that vendor to try to help them sell their product. They also have something called implementation engineers who they're uh, against systems administrators or, or systems engineers who go out and after the customer has purchased the product, the customer might not know how to get it set up. So they actually go and they deploy that product for the customer, 
for an additional fee, of course. So lots of areas that you can get into as a systems administrator, as a systems administrator. So I didn't want to just throw it in tier three like most organizations do, because you could take these skill sets and operate at any one of these roles. One of your duties as a sysadmin, and actually all of those IT tiers, they're going besides zero, they'll play a role in this this portion here, this ticketing, this idea of ticketing or issue tracking. Um, <clears throat> the the whole goal of it is to make sure that you don't lose sight of why you started working on the issue, and you don't lose any information or data that's been collected on the way from this from the um, issue being initially brought to your attention and being resolved. Ticketing, a ticketing system is essentially just a, a tool, a software tool that lets you enter in information as you work through a particular issue. So not, not super complicated. Um, a lot of companies will put it on their like job requirements thing. And maybe you see the name of some of these products and think, oh, Wow, I got to learn that tool too. But they're all pretty much the same. They're pretty straightforward. There's just they're just forms, basically online forms that allow you to key in specific types of information to help you keep track again of a uh, of an issue from start to finish. Um, what are the benefits of the ticketing system, and why do we use them? Well, the ticketing systems themselves, and I'm going to jump forward. The ticketing systems themselves allow you to create this thing called a, a ticket, which is just a, a, just a record of what's going on. And that record helps you to capture information that about the customer that you're trying to serve. It lets you um, capture information about the issue itself, because maybe the, maybe the customer you know, called you or sent you an email, and you don't want to be jumping between calls and emails trying to, trying to you know, remember or trying to remember all of the information that's been shared with you or even information that you gathered as you started to research the issue you want a central place where you can store all of those all of those notes or records of all of those conversations or even information that you gathered maybe as you start to dig into the um into the issue more you've taken screenshots of something uh, or you pull logs on something. Well, the ticketing system allows you to add that stuff in to the record as well. And then you end up with this, 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 I won't say document, but it's a, a digital record or digital folder of all of the information related to that specific um, uh, issue. And it, again, that allows you to work it from start to finish, or in a lot of cases, it allows you to hand it off to somebody else because um, IT people work in teams contrary to popular belief. So if I let's say I start working on this issue, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, I don't get it resolved, but I want to get off work <laughs> or take a break or whatever. I have everything that I've done documented now, all the information that I've collected, I have it documented. So I can hand it off to somebody on my team, or let's say I'm let's say um, this this uh, issue came in as a tier one issue, like they typically do. It comes in from the help desk. The help desk tries X, Y, and Z, or A, B, and C rather, and they can't they can't get it fixed. Tier two folks try you know the the next they try something else. They can't get it fixed, but they update that ticket with their notes. Now they're able to escalate that up to a sysadmin. I have all the notes on everything everybody else has done, so I don't have to waste my time redoing all of that stuff that they have already tried. I can pick up where they left off because we have this running record of what's been done. Or, or I can read through that record and say, oh, the help desk folks forgot to ask this question or the tier two person forgot to do this. Because remember, you're a sysadmin, you're a subject matter expert. So your level of expertise might, it might uh, and you putting in another set of eyes on it, might help you find something that they overlooked. And that's the whole reason for you being there. They're, they're, you're there because you're providing the support for the lower tiers. They have somebody that they can hand up 
a problem that they can't resolve. Um, <clears throat> but without having that ticketing in place, ticketing system in place, it makes it hard to keep track of all of that. So that's why we put these in place and that's why we use them. Um, but there's other cool stuff you can do with them too. You can make them set up alerts. So let's say, you know, instead of me sitting in my ticketing system and watching for incoming, you know, tickets all the time, we can create an a, a email alert that says, okay, when somebody assigns you a ticket uh, in, the, in that particular system, automatically shoot an email off to the person who's been added to the ticket. Or um, when a ticket is closed, notify, notify us. When I add notes to the ticket, shoot an email to the customer so that they can stay in the loop. Um, so there's all types of little um, extra features that can help um, you with tracking the ticket and help give your customer visibility into what's going on in the process of their issue getting resolved. Um, you can also include things like branding in these ticketing systems. Uh, so like if I want it, maybe I purchased this product again from a third party, but I want it to fit seamlessly into uh, my company's website. So we, you can brand it so it has your, lo your logo on it, your company's color scheme and all that other stuff. These are some examples of popular ticketing systems. I know SolarWinds name is mud right now because of that, because of the breach, but SolarWinds is one of the, one of the best tick has one of the best ticketing systems out there. Um, Zendesk is another uh, real popular one, but all of these are viable options. We looked at Spiceworks a little bit. Um, we didn't, we didn't get a chance to fully deploy it, but we will um, in this upcoming lab. Um, <clears throat> but Spiceworks is a, open source uh, and, a, and a free option for ticketing systems. And then you see there's, there's tons of other, this is just a short snippet of all of the different options out there. Another uh, important aspect of systems administration is, in, is monitoring. So monitoring is just watching and collect, uh, watching and processing information, collecting different metrics on hardware and software uh, performance and the things that are going on within your organization. There's all types of stuff you can monitor. You can monitor the network. You can mon monitor application performance. You can monitor hardware performance. So, and it, so there's going to be, because there's so many different things that you can monitor to keep track of, there's a lot of different tools that you can use. We've worked with some of the tools before for example um some of the ones that are built into the operating system uh at the command line things like ping uh things like trace route those are considered monitoring tools because um at their most basic level they test for what a monitor tests for and the uh what a monitor tests for in its simplest form is whether or not something is up or down is the system working or is it not working? Uh, is that network connection live or did somebody or, or did it crash? So that's at its most basic level what a monitor looks for, just to detect in the presence of it uh, something working or not working. But then they have advanced monitors that um, systems administrators and other IT pros can use that will collect all types of advanced performance data. Um, so again, it's just a matter of picking the right tool for the right job. A lot of the tools are built into your operating system, but then there's a, there's a bunch of them that you can purchase as third party tools as well. So why would, why are we going to monitor? Here are some of the, the high points. I alluded to them a little bit, but in more detail, if I want to get visibility and control over my hardware and software, I put a monitoring solution in place because now I can track the health, um, the health of that network or the health of that, that system. Um, so that goes beyond, it's more of an advanced um, feature. It goes beyond just, is it working or is it up or is it down? Um, it goes into, okay, yeah, this, system's, this system is up, but it's not running in an optimal, in an optimal manner. So now I can adjust it. 
again, and that kind of ties into the next one, helps with optimizing network reliability. So uh, optimization from the visibility perspective, I might be looking at things like you know, optimizing CPU performance, optimizing the amount of memory a system has, things of that nature. But one other area that we specifically like to focus on is network connectivity, because nowadays, what is a system if it can't talk on a network? In fact, if, what, what good is a server if nobody can connect into it? The server could be up and running just fine, but if the network connection is no good, it might as well be down. Um, so being able to track that with uh, monitors that specifically watch and uh, watch network connectivity and look at um, the flow of data through your network is important. From a more business standpoint, monitors help the bottom line. They help you with cost savings. If I can, uh, you know, get a better view of my overall you know, IT infrastructure, then I might find places where I can get more optimized. And typically, when you're running things, when you're fine tuning things and you're running at your optimal, there's less waste. And that waste, that reduction in waste can actually save money. So that's like if I was an IT professional trying to pitch you know, a solution that optimized or, you know, maybe, maybe I'm trying to get my execs to buy a monitoring solution and I, and I need to speak their language when I'm trying to sell them on this idea of buying the solution because, you know, business people don't want to spend money. They, they didn't make money. So I'm asking them to spend money. So I got to give them, I have to quantify it for them to make them understand why spending this money is going to save them money in the long run in the long run and having a monitoring tool that's collecting that data gives me my ammunition that I need to go to them and say, you know, I know this is going to cost X amount of dollars, but look how much money that is going to save you if we're able to track these certain things. Um, the monitoring tools also let you create baselines and track capacity. So a baseline being the what a normal operation of a system looks like. That's a baseline. So fresh out of the box or brand new system on the network, this is what it should look like when it's, when it's operating at its optimal setting. That's the standard that I compare everything else against. So this is what it looked like out of the box, you know, on day one, on day 300, if I compare the two, uh, if I compare the two levels of operation, I should be able to see whether or not I'm still operating close to that day one level or if I'm way off and something needs to be fixed. We can also use that as a way, that baseline as a way to track capacity and so that we can build up. Maybe on day one, our system wasn't being stressed, but over time, you know, you know your IT infrastructure doesn't stay the same. You add, you get more clients, you add more servers. So now that that baseline might not be valid anymore because of the, the level of our capacity has grown. So we might need to make improvements based on that. But again, if we don't have any visibility into, into what's going on, then we won't have the data necessary to make those decisions. And then last uh, one to mention here is uh, corporate compliance. So they're going to be, depending on what industry your company's in, they're going to be different um, laws that they have to adhere to, laws and regulations. Some of them will come from business, uh, the business itself. Some of them will come from outside entities like the government. Um, but either way, they have to meet these requirements so there could be fines or jail time involved. So another way to help protect the organization is to have these monitoring tools to make sure that they keep your systems in compliance with whatever, with whatever standards that you have to be in compliance with. These are some common monitoring tools that you'll see. Notice that, that there's some repeats. A lot of these um, software organizations, they'll have several solutions. So SolarWinds has a solution for monitoring. They have a separate solution 
for um, ticketing. They have another solution for um, uh, IP management. So IP address management. Um, so they're, they're basically a suite of applications. Spiceworks is the same way. Spiceworks has several components, it, but they all kind of work together to make a suite of applications. Um, <clears throat> some other ones of note, of course, uh, I have a picture here, what's up, Go, NetApp, um, but all of these are viable um, monitoring tools that you can use. Or the companies at least have a monitoring tool. Uh, Manage Engine is another, another example of one uh, product that has, uh, it's like a suite, it has multiple solutions under their brand. And the whole point of that monitoring, again, is to track and analyze the performance of your systems, the performance of your network and data. Um, and the performance tracking is all about finding trends. So yeah, there, there's gonna be some times where we wanna look at performance at a, you know, a specific date and time, but for the most part, in order to get quality reporting out of what we're monitoring, we need to watch it over a period of time. Um, and as we watch that data and collect that, that information from our monitoring systems over a period of time, we're able, most monitoring systems allow you to export that information out into some, some type of report. That report will allow us, or even prior to the report getting exported, we can, in the system, analyze you know, the data from a specific time period and then generate a report that report is then what we take to an upper level manager or whoever, whatever decision makers that we need to deal with. Um, so to help them make the de make decisions that are based on data and not just somebody's assumptions. All right, and that is it for today's content. Did anybody have any questions? See something in the chat. That is true, Jared. Some monitoring systems do allow, so comma here, some monitoring systems allow remote connections to easily connect users in an organization. That's absolutely true. Some monitoring systems are also cloud-based. So you don't even have to necessarily install them on a system. Um, you'll, con you'll connect to them through some type of network connectivity. You know, uh, you know, public IP address, or um, maybe a maybe you do install like a little client application, a uh, small piece of software on a system, but then it's sending its it's pinging, it's sending updates out to the internet because the the actual monitoring tool is in the cloud. Matter of fact, we talk about cloud services. Monitoring is one of the cloud microservices that most plat most of your public cloud providers provide aws um azure they, they provide all have um network monitoring solutions that they that they tout any other questions or comments all right if there is nothing else it was a pleasure teaching you guys over this semester. Again, just work, work to get those assignments in. I'll have labs 11 and 12 posted for you, you know, in a day or so, so that you can uh, work on those as well. And then look forward for the, um, the project description and the final exam. Do you, um, question, do you feel cloud-based is more common? Um, I, I still think that, that, on-premise uh, network monitoring solutions are still more common, but cloud-based is getting more popular, especially among small and mid-sized companies who don't want to who don't want to pay to build a server for for monitoring services when they could just pay a subscription and access it that way. And Lauren, if you want to hold on. Uh, hold on after everybody logs off, we can take a look at your issue. Okay.
Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. All right. You have a good one, too. All right, if you want to go ahead and share your screen out with me. Okay, okay, so wait, wait a sec. Because I have one, so I have, um, what's it called? I have Fusion, because I have, only have my Mac right now. I'm at my sister's, I'm babysitting my niece. So oh, okay. I'm, I only have my Mac. It might be better with my Windows, because that's, well, my Mac, when I did download it on my Mac, it was giving me straight error messages. But on my Windows, it doesn't give me error messages. It lets me go through the whole installation process, and then it'll say, like, restart now, whatever. Yeah. Then so one- so oh. what, what I think is happening on your Windows PC is um, uh, that ISO file is, like, basically like an electronic version of a DVD, right, with mm-hmm. all the files on it. So... Imagine if we were doing this on a real computer and you put the DVD into the into the laptop or desktop or whatever, and you started the machine up. It, if you if you had it set up to install the operating system, then the first thing the computer is going to read is the DVD because that's where the install files are. And, it, and if you keep the DVD in the tray in the DVD ROM, it'll keep reading it every time you reboot the computer. So that's what's happening virtually on your system. Because that ISO file is still in the quote unquote virtual DVD tray, every time you reboot the system, it tries to read the DVD. What you have to do is you got to go into the settings of your virtual machine and tell it, don't look at it and remove that ISO file because you've already run it. You already did it. You said you did the installation all the way through and mm-hmm. then you reboot it and try to do it again. Yeah. And so you have to go into the settings. And then you'll see that, um, let me see if I can show you. I think I got VMware play on this machine. Let me, uh, let me. Okay, Mia. Yeah, sorry. I'm, yeah, if you hear baby noises, I'm so sorry. Not good. <laughs> um, <laughs> she don't have VMware play on this computer. Yeah, I think it was better on my um my Windows PC instead of my Mac because I was having all types of problems, but my Ubuntu works beautifully on my Mac. I'm gonna download VMware Player real quick. Okay. Yeah, I, look, these little labs are giving me a hard time. I tell you. Was, was this your first time building VMs? Um, so Windows VMs, yes, but I've built a bunch of before. So I did it last semester. So it wasn't my first time working with a bunch of, but Windows, yeah. That's the one you need to know. You're, right? <laughs> That's the <laughs> one I need the most. <laughs> Yeah, because I think I went to the CIS Tech Hub too, and they told me to download this one ISO file, but that didn't work for me either. So I was like, eh. so if this is um, yeah, I say if this doesn't work, then I'll, I'll go back to the CIS Tech Hub tomorrow because I'm gonna try what you show me today on my Windows computer when I get back. But then I'll contact them again because I gotta get this done. Like I've never been this behind. This really shuts me out.